So this meeting is now being recorded. Eventually it will get uploaded to the Town of Amherst YouTube channel. Everything that is said in this meeting um, will be part of the recording. And I am promoting Councillor Kathy Shane as the host for this meeting. Recording in progress. Thank you, Thank everyone. Thank you, everyone. And have a, and great, have a meeting. great meeting. Thank you, Thank Angela. You, Angela. Oh dear. Oh dear. <laughs> now, why? No. I don't know why I would get an echo. Is the echo going? Yeah. Okay. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, this is the subcommittee of the net zero committee of the elementary school building committee. And I am the chair of the main committee, but I'm hoping I will quickly be able to turn over chairdom to somebody else. And J Jonathan Salvin has agreed to do it, but I just, I want to call the meeting to order First, we're conducting it virtually. So I need to make sure that everyone who he is here as a panelist, the subcommittee members who I will introduce as well as the panelists can see and be heard. Um, the other thing I will be doing um, as the host once I move away from being chair is I'll be promoting some of the people who are in our audience because we have people who were the co-authors of our net zero bylaw who are architects interested within town so that we don't have them have to be in the public but i'll ask them not to, to to wait till we have a fuller discussion to join in so i am just going to go across the screen first calling on the subcommittee members um, to make sure they can see hear and be heard uh, jonathan good afternoon jonathan salvan committee member um, and also an architect and parent at the uh, parent of a Fort or two Fort River school students. Great. And uh, Jonathan is also an architect for those who haven't met him before and here in town. Rupert uh, Roy Clark. Yes, I can hear you and see you. I am the facilities director and a member of the uh, building committee. And um, I'm hoping Ben Harrington will be joining us also. We have one other member of the building committee who has joined us. He isn't officially a member of the subcommittee, but we will always welcome him, Sean Magnano. I, I can hear everybody. Okay, and I, what I, I think I'm gonna do before I open it up um, for choosing a, a chair or asking Jonathan to take over chair is just so quickly across um, all the other pictures I see. So you can introduce yourselves for people we haven't met before. And so that the public who's on this can hear who, who you are. Um, so I, you know, I'll just do it as the names I see on the screen. Um, so Vivian, you're my first on my top row. Great, right, thank you. Vivian Lowe with Denisco Design. We're the architects for the project. Donna? Donna Denisco with Denisco Design. Happy to be here, excited to be here. And Donna, why don't you just call out the next person on your team Tim. and then I'll, okay. Perfect, Hi. Tim. Tim Cooper, project manager with NISCO. And Colin? I'm Colin, I'm an architect with NISCO. And then I think we have several yeah. of your consultants we here do. too. We do, we do. We'll start, we'll start with Simoon O. Oh. Simoon O, oh, I'm a mechanical engineer. Thank you. And then Vampshi. Vamshi Gujay with Thornton Thomas City. We are ZNE and and sustainable consultant in the project. And Sunny, along with Sunny Human. Sunny Jolly, also with Thornton Thomas City. Uh, we are the ZNE and sustainability consultant. Okay. And then we have two members of the owner's project management team, the answer team with us um, Margaret and then Shelley. Hi. This is Margaret Wood. Uh, as Kathy says, uh, I'm the owner's project manager representative on the project. Shelley? And Shelley Podorf. I'm an architect specializing in high performance buildings, working with Anzer on the owner project rep side of things. Can we also introduce Nicole, uh, who's also, also with Nicole? Nicole, why don't you go ahead? Yeah, Nicole. Hi, everyone. Hi, everyone. I'm with Thornton Tomasetti, um, with Bamshi and Sunny as well, and I'm a daylight specialist. Well, thank you all very much for joining us. Um, you know, I would like to nominate Jonathan Salvin to be chair of this subcommittee, and hopefully he will accept, and then 
I will turn sharing over him. And I think Jonathan, you also agreed to do a brief uh, pre re review of what's in our net zero bylaw so that you, for all the design team, everyone is on the same page. So do, do I hear a second for my nomination? Of second, Jonathan? I second it. Okay, and um, I think there are only Ben hasn't joined us, so three of the four of us are here, Jonathan. So I will call on Jonathan to vote first. I'll vote for myself. Okay, and I will vote for Jonathan and Rupert. I vote aye, and Ben, do you vote for Jonathan to chair the subcommittee? I vote aye. Ben okay. votes aye. Okay. I think it, he's joining us soon. <laughs> okay, ben, ben is on his way in. Okay, so Ben is yes. Okay, great. So Ben Harrington will be joining us. Okay, so Jonathan, I'm going to turn it over to you, and if it's okay with you to bring bring in some of the people that you can see in the participants, or do you want me to wait? Um, well, I think you can you can bring them in. I, unfortunately, I'm not sure that I can fully see them because, as host, you can still see things that I can't. Okay. Um, but but I but but I I'm sure you you see folks that you'd like to let in. So I think you can do that. We'll just okay. ask that you know we we get going in this process and then okay uh, so, ask, so you, you get hands. going and that what i'm going to ask is if i bring people in if you would just mute your mics and then wait till we open it up but i want to make sure that everybody can see everyone who else is on we have 11 additional people um and maybe just uh, let's see i can allow to talk i think i can promote promote to panelists okay jonathan you can go ahead while i'm doing okay. this <laughs> so good afternoon <laughs> Um, and I'm going to share my screen just so that we can have the text up here. And oh boy, I have way too much on my screen. So hopefully I'm picking the right thing here. Okay, can folks see this document on the screen? I can. Okay. Yes. Great. So, and I'm probably gonna get my history a little wrong. But in approximately 2018 or 2019, uh, the, the town uh, passed uh, a, a zero net energy bylaw, went through all the requirements uh, for the attorney general, and it's been in place for a few years. And while we've had a couple projects begin their process, um, this project will probably be the, the, the fullest test um, of, of this new bylaw. And so I'm going to kind of walk through the requirements. There's a whole section of um, definitions before that, which we can return to if there are questions that people have. But for the purposes of kind of educating myself and the um, the other members of the of the committee and and members of the public that might be attending, we'll just kind of walk through the requirements. And I apologize if I'm a little hard to hear because of the mass today, a little technology uh, snafu, and I wasn't able to secure a room where I could take this mask off. So uh, what does this bylaw apply to? Well, it applies to all new town buildings and building additions. Um, and I'm not gonna read this word for word, um, but the intent is to, to design them to net zero energy capable. Uh, and in, implicit in that is to operate without fossil fuels except for things like emergency generators, uh, process energy, specialized equipment. The other thing that, that may or may not be kind of Amherst unique um, is that the renewable energy is uh, intended to be uh, generated in association with the project if possible, or practical, I guess. Um, it, in this bylaw applies to all projects that are new buildings or additions over $2 million, which clearly this project will be. Um, you know, for projects that are combined, as we will explore as part of our, our charge from the MSBA, um, for projects that combine a renovation and new addition, um, only the new addition piece uh, for the purposes of this bylaw has to meet the requirements of the bylaw. Do I hear a question? Oh, nope. Um, for projects that this applies to, uh, the, well, this one I might actually read a little bit. For all projects 
to which this bylaw applies, the town shall design a zero net energy capable project in compliance with this bylaw. If the costs of purchase and installation of the town owned new and independently measured renewable energy, energy systems for the project exceed 10%, the net energy ready project costs uh, minus, which are total project costs minus purchase and installation costs of the renewable energy systems. Um, if, if, if that is met, if that threshold is met, then the town shall proceed with net zero energy capable project and include in that design as much renewable energy, renewable energy systems for the project as equals the 10% of the net energy ready project costs and plan to obtain any remaining energy capability, capabilities, capacities to meet the remaining needs by renewable energy as long as one, as, as long as the per kilowatt hour cost is less than or comparable to the per kilowatt hour costs of utilities provided, of utility provided electricity in the first year of the contract. Only in the last circumstance may the town purchase energy that is not specifically dedicated to the project. So that's a, for me, this is a little bit of a dense section, but I think we can talk a little bit more about it in detail. Uh, renewable energy systems not on the project site or not in the same electrical meter as the subject buildings or building additions may be used if insufficient solar or wind exposure is available, is, isn't insufficient solar or wind exposure is available on the project site. Renewable energy systems shall be dedicated exclusively to the project and the energy generated shall be measured independently. This is a kind of a, a key piece that the project and the renewable energy must be tied together. Now may sell the, the renewable energy credits compliance with the bylaw. How will the bylaw be kind of enforced, reviewed? <clears throat> Certificate, the certific certification by the architect of record that the final design documents, if followed, will, produ will produce a completed project that is net zero energy capable, which to me translates that the architect of record has to state that, the, that they have met the bylaw. In addition to that, a peer review will be needed. A peer review confirming that in the opinion of a third party reviewer, the final construction documents, if followed, will produce a completed project that is net, that is zero <laughs> energy capable. Third, complete completed contracting, complete contracting for commissioning at a suitable point prior to occupancy and recommissioning at a point 12 months after occupancy. However, the failure to achieve the net zero requirement at the 12 month recommissioning shall not affect compliance with the bylaw. And four, compliance shall be measured by the project's site energy, not source energy. Okay, the last part of the bylaw uh, is implementation the town and the project end users shall undertake on a good faith basis to formulate a preliminary budget uh, energy budget for the project consistent with the zero energy requirements prior to schematic design that's really the to me this is the part we're starting very soon with this meeting really uh, but in additional meetings as well and to endeavor to operate the project in accordance with the final energy budget for the project consistent with the zero energy requirements. To report publicly, actually to report to the public annually, the energy performance of the project for 10 years from the date of occupancy. So that's, that's kind of where we're starting. Um, and I think what I might like to first do is just ask the design team if they, uh, they presumably all read it. Do you have some general questions that, that we can begin to assist you with on this? Uh, I certainly have a question uh, about the uh, definition of the renewable energy systems and what is included in the 10% and what is not, whether it's just the PV or source generation or 
as the wording would suggest, it's the systems that that's tied to, and then what part of that system, you know? So I'm sure there's some intent there, but uh, we'd just like to understand that a little better. Yep. And I might actually like to now, Kathy, call on the, on the knowledge and the historic wisdom of some of the folks who helped draft this. Sure, Jonathan, if you, if you take down this, I think- Yeah, I, I, I want to stop I've, sharing. Yeah, so people can see each other. So you can see there who's are. here too, okay? So both Chris Riddle, Rudy Perkins, and Lynn Griesmer are all here. So um, I think you've got your author team. Indeed, and I also saw, I think Bruce's hand up for a second ago as well. Um, I, so could you, uh, Tim, repeat your question one more time and, and then we'll, we'll dig into it a little bit. Sure. The 10% that is referred to in the law that uh, beyond which you can enter in a PPA or something like that, we just want to know that 10% is defined as the cost of the renewable energy system. And if you read the definition of renewable energy system, it says mechanical or electric system connected to the PV. So um, we, it, just a clarification on what that includes. Is it just the power generating systems or the systems that they connect to and service the building. Uh, it's just uh, to let us understand, you know, what we're dealing with. So I'm going to try to scan around, see if I can see a hand raised. Um, and for some of these, I may have simply have to take a note and, and, and get Rudy's back. Got his, folks, Rudy's but, got his uh, hand up. Uh, yep. Rudy, can you unmute? Yeah. Can you hear me? Yep. Um, I, hopefully we all have the same understanding of this, but I, this came out of the discussion about the addition of the renewable energy. So, um, and the, the cost test was connected to those systems like PV systems. So my take on this is that the definition of renewable energy systems just really means the renewable energy equipment and not all of the ventilation and, uh, you know, peripheral building systems that would have been there in the first place. So uh, hopefully everybody else, Lynn and, and others, and uh, had that same understanding. Lynn has her hand up. Um, first of all, let me just correct the record. I'm not an architect. Um, even though I was on the committee to um, do this. And although I've been involved in building projects, I think that Rudy's uh, interpretation is correct. But let me preface our discussion here by saying, uh, this is the first building we have are building based on this bylaw. And um, even though I was not one of the original architects, I was on the committee that did the rewrite on it along with Rudy and um, I think I saw him earlier, Chris Riddle, who are here. Um, and I think that one of the things that we will be as interested in as a town, as you are as interested in as the committee and the architects is whether there are still pieces in this that may still be unworkable, that we may have to look at more closely. And I think that that is a reasonable thing that we should all just kind of be keeping an, a notepad on the side that says, are there places where we need to do further clarification with the bylaw or possible other modifications? But I just want to say it's exciting to be at this moment in Amherst's history. And we want to thank you all for uh, diving into this bylaw and to this project in a way that I hope and I know will lead to a great elementary school. Thanks. Vivian, do you, do you want to uh, follow up on, on Tim's question? Yes, yeah, so uh, thank you for clarifying that we're talking about the system that provides the renewable energy, right? So we're talking about PVs, canopy systems potentially. So if we're looking at the cost, of this equipment, um, we would be interested in determining whether it's the town's goal to actually purchase and own this equipment versus to contract 
because those are very different costs. And then there are also time um, requirements. And, and this also folds into the, the lead certification and all that fun stuff. But I think if, um, if you can clarify and talk a little bit about the goals, is it, is it the intent that we purchase as part of this project? Rudy, you want to chime in? Sure. Um, yeah, the intent was that the project actually include the town owning, say, the PV systems and incorporating that in the project. And there was a attached report at the time of the uh, this bylaw revision that sort of clarified that. Um, but it's also in the definitions of uh, the renewable energy capable versus renewable energy ready and the 10% test. So um, you build, you basically build the PV unless it's gonna cost more than 10% of the cost of the project without the PV. And in that case, and these other options come in. Does that, does that help? Yes, it does, thank you. Other questions, Donna? Yeah, thank you. Um, just, just to add on to that, and first of all, we are so excited to be part of this process with you. And, and we, we really look at this as a true partnership and we're, we're, we're gonna ask some questions up front to make sure we all fully understand. And, and this conversation will obviously continue all the way through. But as far as the town owning the equipment, um, it, are there folks in town that we would work closely with to purchase and, and find the rest, right solutions? Um, how, how do you envision that working? We have, um, as part of our team, Solar Design Associates, some of you may know them, who would help facilitate how much solar we need, where they may go, where is the best location, et cetera, et cetera, that we will engage with. But as far as the actual procurement and understanding that whole process, um, is there someone in town to assist us? Thank you. That, that is a really good question. I'm gonna hold, I don't personally know the answer to that. And I see a couple other hands raised, but um, I am taking note as well. Uh, Chris Riddle, would you like to unmute? I'm on my phone. I don't know how to use the phone. Ah, hi, Chris Riddle, uh, uh, ex of Kuhn Riddle Architects, and on the, on the one of the people that created this bylaw. Um, uh, I, I want to comment on one question that was asked a couple of a couple of questions ago, which was um, that made reference to if you did um, ground mounted solar um, and put it on a canopy over a parking lot, that that's very likely a, a very likely possibility. Um, and I think that's a, I would say that that's a fairly, um, I can't answer that based on the bylaw, we can't answer that. I can't answer that question. Maybe Rudy or Lynn could, could, but I think that the question of the uh, building a canopy over a parking lot, does the cost of the canopy tr get cranked into that 10% or not? Um, I, I would say that when I was do, when I was working on this, I was thinking that it was the PV, the inverters, and, and all the wiring that goes between them, and that was the number. And that's what the numbers. And what we did was, we compared a, a project. To, well, we actually, I compared to the Hitchcock Center, something else I had an involvement with, and used the value of the PV there. And it was something in the order of 5% or 4% of the construction cost of the building. And I thought that making it 10% was, has lots of wiggle room in it and that we shouldn't get there. If we have to start building structure to hold these things up that is dedicated to them, I'm not sure where that sits. It's a good question. I think a really good question that we need to face up to. Lynn, do you want to... Uh, can could you address perhaps the, the question about who in, who in town would be the, yeah. kind of the right contact? So he's sitting in the room and that's Sean. Okay. And the reason I mentioned Sean, and I just think we should stop right there is he knows attention. what we do. Okay. Yeah. So I'll, I will make note of that and we can have a, a follow-up conversation. Sean, do you want to talk? Yeah. I mean, I guess I need to understand the, 
what the question is, um, and I can work with Donna and um, yep. Margaret on this more. If, if the question is, are we procuring the solar panels separately from the project itself? Yeah, we can work on what the process would be. Um, I sort of envision this would be part of the design. And when we go out to procure for construction, maybe there's a sub bid or um, the, con the construction firm would hire a subcontractor to fulfill this, but I can work with the designer and the OPM to figure out what's the, you know, how do we get the best price and the best quality um, uh, solar panels uh, for this project? Yeah, thank you, Sean. I think um, we'll soon, soon to be bringing in uh, solar design associates so that they're, they're engaged from the very beginning as well with you all as, as we look at the options and viability on both sites for PV. Other, are there general questions or, or should I begin to think to move ahead to the Denisco kind of pre presenting some initial thoughts and strategy, strategies? Chris, is your hand still up or, or is that from before? Uh, yes, it is, but I didn't mean it for it to be, but now I do. Um, uh, I, I, uh, my question has to do with uh, the kinds of uh, standards that are not included in this uh, bylaw. And those have to do with the kind, those are the kind of standards that show up in LEED or Living Building Challenge or Passive House or something like that. Uh, uh, tell me this, is this to be a, a LEED certified project? That's, that's my question. Well, the one thing I can answer is that it will either be that or CHIPS as part mm -hmm. of the, the, the process that we go through with the, the MSBA. Um, and certainly it's probably gonna be this committee that will which may the subcommittee which may recommend to the broader committee which of those two paths to take um, and so in addition to to looking at and I probably should have said this at the top um, in addition to looking at specific net zero um, the questions and applicability and how we get there uh, this committee the subcommittee will likely look at the broader uh, issues around sustainability um, and try to you know advise and, and work with the design team uh, towards those those goals. That almost sounds like a segue into the next section, but I see that Bruce has his hand up. Um, Jonathan, just to clarify what you just said, um, there's a huge difference between um, achieving the standards dictated by or established by uh, LEED or CHIPS, and uh, as far as LEED is concerned, for example, um, seeking certification. I would speak strongly in favor of the first, but uh, strongly opposed uh, to the proposition that we spend 60 or 80 or whatever th uh, thousand dollars uh, to get a LEED certification. I think we, uh, we have no, I don't, I can't see that there's brand value in doing that. Mm -hmm. So I, I guess the, the question then is, does the, do we believe that we need to seek, purchase and achieve something like a lead certification? Is that something that this committee feels is important? Bruce, if, if I may um, just jump in, this is Donna Danisco. Um, MSBA requires that the projects are certified either by lead or uh, New England chips. We, we don't have a choice, but I would like to just say that in our recent experience, the cost for the registration and certification is maybe around twenty thousand um, dollars. That the design and all the level of effort that goes into it between the design team and the construction company is is already baked into the cost of the work. But the town is going to have to do either lead or chips because it's an MSBA project. Is chips also a twenty thousand dollar price tag? Uh, I haven't done it lately, but I'm going to assume it is. It is Bam. She's nodding. I, I, yeah. 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 Okay. They kind of are in the same ballpark. It depends on the project scale and size, but yeah. And one more thing to just add to that conversation is also uh, some of the pieces we are talking as part of the bylaws also align with um, you know the certification requirements. So we're not doing anything. Uh, up and beyond what bylaws are asking. So in my opinion, um, 
there is some level of rigor associated with uh, achieving these certification systems. Uh, just helps the design team and construction teams to kind of follow the guidelines and ultimately, you know, get us a really good building that, you know, the town is going to own for a very long time. Chris, your, your hand's raised again. Yes, it is. Um, uh, can I speak briefly about the notion of renovation versus new construction? Um, uh, there is big cranked into this bylaw uh, a sort of a, um, an, well, an incentive for buildings to be a, a dollar incentive for buildings to be renovated if they exist rather than uh, uh, torn down and replaced and building new construction. The bylaw doesn't, uh, doesn't affect renovation. Um, and so the cost for renovating a square foot of existing building is all you, uh, it doesn't involve any expenditure for renewable energy or for, for anything really under the bylaw. So there's an incentive to um, renovate rather than a dollar incentive to renovate rather than to uh, 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 tear down and build new. Um, I want to spend, uh, place the case before this body about the, the, the virtue of the, well, the second one, not the, uh, in, over the first one that we should not consider, at least if we're talking about the Fort River or the, or the Boywood school buildings. Um, these are buildings, I'm not, often, I don't, I'm not always in the position of advocating that we tear things down and throw them away. In this case, I am because they are so bad as far as the en energy, their energy performance is concerned. Um, if this, I don't know if anybody knows how familiar with R factors, but the R factor of the exterior walls in both buildings is something like one and a half. Um, for any, I presume that we'll be talking about exterior wall R factors more in uh, at least 10 times that or 15 times that. That's really bad. And the, the buildings have no under slab insulation. So that's zero insulation on the slab. And the roofs are perhaps marginally okay. The buildings all have single glazed windows. So you're talking about something that is going to need to be reworked. If you try to keep these existing buildings, you have to keep, you have to rework substantially the floor plans and you have to make them handicap accessible and you probably have to put in um, a new HVAC system, probably a new electrical service. A whole, it's going to, there's no virtue, there's no dollar virtue anymore in trying to renovate either Wildwood or Fort River. And uh, because it's uh, because the numbers won't work, it, it won't be a, it, numbers won't work, and the uh, atmosphere will be unhappy. We won't have we won't have uh, we'll have a poorly a poorly performing buildings that um, that cost maybe a little bit yet let you less than or maybe even a little bit more than new construction. So I'm just placing the case for uh, early on, uh, please. Uh, don't try to renovate either Fort River or, or Wildwood buildings. Let's just get rid of them and start with a proper building. That's my statement. So I, I see two more hands raised. I see uh, Donna and Lynn. And I think Donna's was up first, so I think I'm going to mm. go to her next. Um, but I'll start off by saying, while I, I, I hear you, Mr. Riddle, uh, the process will require us to look at a broad range. And I'm sure Donna will touch on that. But we must, as part of the MSBA process, look at new construction, renovation and expansion, and renovation. Yes, and thank you. Yeah, no, that's it. Well, it's two, two things. And, and I, I see Marie Kapicki also has her hand up. But um, so we will look at in, in earnest what it will take to make the existing building in part or whole as part of a renovation or addition. Um, a sound educational facility that will meet the criteria set forth by the town and also MSBA. Um, MSBA also has strict guidelines for certain energy requirements, et cetera. And we will have to do it. And, and you know, it has to be an objective uh, process. And, and we're weighing all of that out right now. We're putting together cri uh, priorities and criteria evaluation to which way against all the options, and that will be important. Um, MSBA, as far as reimbursement is concerned, MSBA will give uh, communities uh, a certain money, a percentage of the saved building, so as a reimbursement, up to five points. So if you reuse an entire building with no addition, you get 5% more reimbursement. 
by the state. If you use 10%, um, you get a portion of the 5%. So, so it becomes a formula. And, and, and in the end, unless you're reusing the entire building with a very small or no addition, the money kind of uh, flips and that you don't get as much um, more payback by the by MSBA. But I do want to point that out that that will be part of our valuation. So you'll see how much money MSBA will be contributing. And probably more importantly to this community is what is the town share, right? And, and that, that will all play out as we look at all the options. Uh, Lynn, I'm going to go to you next, and then uh, we'll, I'm not sure if Maria has been promoted to uh, ask a question yet, but we'll figure that out after, after you, Lynn. Okay. Oh, I'm not going to comment at this point on whether I think we should tear down the old building or not, because I preside over the body that's actually going to make a decision about what we're going to do in terms of going forward for the financing of this, not not the design, but the financing. But I want to also call attention and mention that in our audience today are both Laura Drucker, who is chair of our ECAC committee, and it also Maria Kapecki. I mean, I'm sorry, and also, um, oh, come on, where did she go? Um, Stephanie Ciccarella, who's staff to that committee. And the fact that Amherst does have its own goals as well as the state goals for 2050 in terms of sustainability. And uh, that as we strive toward those goals, we need to look at whatever we do with regard to a renovation, regardless of what this bylaw says in terms of contributing to the achievement of those goals. And at some point, Stephanie, I'm sure, and Laura would be glad to make that report um, that they just had and brought to the council with our full acceptance uh, to this body as well. Thank you. And Maria, I can see your hand raised, but I suspect you can't ask your question yet. But why don't I you try? Think... Oh, you can. Look at that. Yeah, I, I have. <laughs> I, I, I don't see my picture, but I but I have the ability to unmute. Thank you, um, uh, Donna. I want I I want to appreciate your comments about needing to do a thorough analysis of renovation. And there are some people who have the opinion that this, uh, there sh this should not be renovated and not even address it from the beginning. But as you all well know, that's, that's not what we are required to do, nor is that opinion shared by everyone in town or by many people in the Sustainability Architecture Committee. And I know that you have probably all attended MSBA conferences talking about sustainability and talking about renovation. So um, this does have to be explored and thoroughly and uh, letting people know that we are not coming to a predestined conclusion. Um, so I really, I appreciate that your comments there, Donna. Thank you. Well, Unless folks have uh, additional questions directly on the bylaw, I would like, since we have a certain limited amount of time, I don't want to to uh, drop something off our agenda for today, this first meeting. I think I'd like to uh, hand things over to Donna for a while uh, to present some thoughts. Um, after that, we're going to be, we can come back to some questions and discussions, and then we can open things up for additional uh, public comments. Donna? Yeah, thank you, Ashley. Um, Tim Cooper and Vamshi. Vamshi, do you have, do you have the presentation? Yeah, I do have a presentation. Okay. Um, I think Sunny's going to share her screen. Yeah, yeah. I can share, I can my, share my screen. I, I, don't, I, I, don't, I don't know if you two are together, together, but together, but feedback, feedback is crazy when you two are both on. <laughs> uh, that's usually my computer. I don't know. It's acoustics in my office is bad. All right, maybe I can just take um, uh, take the conversation here and set the stage. Um, just so we just wanted to talk a few things, the primary goal for us to, um, for this, at least the first meeting is to kind of give you a layout of how we typically achieve a zero net energy school building. Uh, and these are based on our experience working on currently 
um, a few uh, ZNE schools in the Massachusetts um, uh, area or state of Massachusetts. Um, th these are some of the successful uh, steps and also some strategies. We're not going to get too much into the strategies and depending on how, you know, uh, how much time we have, we are more than willing to talk about them as well. Um, but we wanted to kind of bring everybody on the same page and kind of give out um, um, a, a perspective of how the roadmap looks for ZNE building. Uh, the first and foremost thing I'd like to um, talk about is what uh, is a ZNE building. I'm, I'm assuming everybody knows it, but just for the purposes of uh, you know common definition, uh, there are several definitions. But in alignment with Amherst's uh, bylaw, what we are foreseeing ZNE definition would be is the building is going to use as much energy as it's going to produce that on site and given that this is going to be all electric um, which is the right direction for zni buildings uh, for several reasons we can talk about that um, we would like to our primary goal is to reduce the what we call as eui which is which stands for energy use intensity number which is basically taking your annual energy use in BTUs and normalizing over the square footage of the building. And what that really does is helps us to understand how our school works or performs compared to other schools. And for schools, typically we have seen um, a target of 25 to 28 um, to achieve a ZNE status. And when we say uh, you know, why not higher or lower? Uh, definitely you can shoot for lower or higher, but you know, conservation is the most important thing. Um, we can make an inefficient building and put a lot of PV, which does not make sense. So our primary goal here as part of the ZNE process is to reduce the amount of energy this building is gonna use. So if you look at, um, the most of the Zini schools in our climate zones, we are talking about 25 EUI or in that ballpark, uh, including Massive actually has a ZNE path one program, which uh, dictates that EUI to be 25. And here's a benchmark just to give a sense to uh, the folks on the meeting here, how different buildings have been using EUI um, these are not net zero buildings, all of them, but the NZ, ZNE buildings are um, in the green color. So you can see they're between 25 to 30 EUI. And this is what's going to drive our um, analysis as we move, move forward um, to ensure our envelope. We, we were talking earlier about existing versus a completely new building, and there are challenges for you know, existing buildings, you know, then how do we make it work so that we still meet our low EUI? Um, and one more thing is all, all, all the PV uh, renewable energy system is an integral part of the discussion. Um, we kind of heavily focus on making the EUI as small as possible, as I mentioned, because um, that takes a lot of effort uh, from all uh, disciplines on the design team. Uh, so we work very collaboratively. Um, it, we try to have every discipline on the discussion so that we can look at any you know synergies between decisions that we are making um, uh, as the design progresses. So uh, if you move on to the next slide, uh, so this is a typical process. You know, this is not all exhaustive list of conservation measures and strategies we uh, look at, but just to give you a snapshot how that works. So we are starting with a high baseline, um, MSBA baseline in our case, um, because that is the code to build to. Uh, the first and foremost thing is to uh, uh, improve the envelope, improve or reduce the loads. So when you have very minimal loads, um, you know, the mechanical systems and HV systems can, can be smaller, first of all, 
because you have smaller loads and they can efficiently add heating or cooling to the space. Um, so that is the sequence of things how, on how we look at. Um, and then we go and uh, talk about daylighting, how, how the daylight is harvested into the building. Um, of course, with LED technology, the amount of savings that we were ge getting before the LEDs were uh, prevalent um, is the lower, uh, but you know, there are other pieces to also look at. More daylight not necessarily mean uh, a good, good goal. We have to balance between glare and how much daylight we're getting and also look at how that impacts our energy performance because more glass means we are losing more heat as well. So we will, we will do that analysis, um, integrated analysis when we're uh, performing energy modeling uh, pieces. And then we come to the HVAC system which uh, you know, significantly reduces the energy and that, and that is the system that is gonna take care of all the heating and cooling needs. And heat pump technology has come a long way. Even in very cold temperatures, it can uh, perform at higher efficiencies. Um, and there are various configurations that, you know, Simon may talk about it today um, during this meeting. We will evaluate those mechanical systems. And then ultimately, uh, what we have found is um, the user behavior is very important for ZNE schools uh, to be successful. And the reason is, you know, the design team can deliver a really good envelope, a really good uh, HVAC system. Ultimately, if the users are not aware of how these things work, they may start using um, the building in a different way and which could increase the energy use. And the other piece is the commissioning that is required by bylaw as well and also MSBA. Um, that's a, so that's a no-brainer. But we've seen more often than we'd like to admit that things don't work as they should, although the system and designs, everything are great. Um, there are so many things that are uh, identified during commissioning process. Um, and I think it's a very important piece for ZNE schools and also post occupancy studies would be great just so that um, you know this you understand where exactly things went wrong. Um, is it uh, during operations or is something in the HVAC system that failed uh, so that you can rectify and really get the performance that we would um, evaluate or assess uh, during these design phases. And Sunny can move on. So one of the key pieces for uh, this, to hit this really low UI target is, um, you know, front-loaded analysis because design is moving very fast. What we would like to do is do this analysis. Typically in a typical uh, building, you know, you kind of laid out during design development and do analysis, which is too late. Um, we want to make sure these decisions are made early on so that when we go to, um, you know, at the end of the PSR or SD phase, we know pretty much what the building is going to look like and what systems are going to go in. There might be few tweaks once you are in design development phase, but most of the um, important and key systems are in place or in base of design. Oh, we'll work work work. Sorry, sorry, you guys, you guys, you can't. We keep getting echoes. Yeah, sorry. I was just gonna say we're gonna share our uh, work plan at the end of this discussion. So I think bottom line uh, for everyone, we we um, will be having lots of conversations with you all to make sure that everyone's in agreement with. Um, everything that we will be including as part of and how we're going to achieve, we're looking at around a 25 EUI is our goal for this for the for the building, whether it's renovation or re or new. Our goal is to have it around 25 EUI, and there are different ways to get there. And then the question really becomes, which I believe um, maybe that would be the next conversation, Vamshi, is how 
what what if it if it's um, non fossil and it's going to be PVs, we still have to talk about the systems and how we're going to uh, um, actually provide the heat and the uh, cooling into the building and what the distribution of that would look like. Yeah, and Christopher uh, uh, has a question. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Hello. Chris, sorry, go ahead. We... Oh, you're, I'm, I can talk. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, have, uh, what is this bill? This bylaw says nothing about embodied energy, embodying carbon. Um, do, will that be part of your considerations when we're thinking of, for instance, the structural system and so forth? Yeah, we can take a look at it. Uh, and obviously, the bylaw is talking about primarily operational energy or operational I'm, I'm carbon. Sorry. Am I echoing? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, did, did you catch what I said, Christopher? I'm sorry. I'm sorry. What? What? I I didn't. You didn't hear. Okay. Let me repeat myself. If yeah, you guys yeah, can. I did, I, I, oh, I'm 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 echoing. I'm I'm going to mute me. Okay. In a mess. In a mess. Okay, there you go. Yeah, no, you know, obviously what I was saying is by law is talking about operational carbon, not necessarily looking at the embodied carbon, um, but, you know, the certification system LEED has one uh, credit that actually touches upon the embodied carbon, which is uh, uses life cycle assessment to look at, you know, retaining the existing structure or uh, using you know building materials that have lowest in, uh, embodied carbon so that could be part of our analysis but that goes parallel with um, the operational carbon analysis i believe sarah has her hand up Hi, I just wanted to ask, Vamji, um, thanks for walking us through this. Would your go-to system for HVAC be a geothermal system? Uh, and then like, if if we can't accommodate that from a safe perspective, then move on, Is that would that be your first go-to for HVAC? Actually, actually I'll, I'll, I can respond to that. I, what we're gonna, we would actually like to have that conversation with you all and look at the different options. Um, it could be a VRF system or it could be a geothermal system. We've done both. And really, it will be a matter of what uh, it, it's your decision, right? It, um, it, it will come down to we, we will perform a life cycle cost analysis and you can evaluate, right? There may be more first cost with, with the geothermal than a VRF system, but we'll walk through the different options and the different sites are, are unique. And so there may be different parameters and costs associated with the geothermal system at both sites, right? We have what we have wet on one and, and uh, ledge and everything going on at the other one. So I think we want to, we, we don't have any preconceived direction. We want to weigh it all with you all for you to determine what, what works best for you all. So uh, ability to uh, accommodate geothermal will be part of the site evaluation considerations. And is that what I'm hearing? Yes. Awesome. I'm going to use my headphones. I think this will be a little better. Um, yeah, just, just to add to that also, uh, what we have seen, Sarah, is geothermal obviously is the most efficient system uh, uh, right now available. Uh, it's going to definitely get us the lowest energy possible. But you know, as Donna has mentioned, there are other considerations to look at, uh, the side issues, um, and also the life cycle cost analysis. Uh, some of the ZNE schools that we are working on, um, it has, I'm, I'm probably getting too much into details, but you know, 100% of geothermal did not uh, you know, get us a good return on investment. So we, we looked into partial, like a hybrid system, and that, that made a whole lot of sense. So that, that would become 
you know, that uh, come uh, as part of our analysis when we start looking at it. And definitely every project is different, but that's the theme that we have seen. I see a, another raised hand from Bruce. Uh, yes, uh, I guess a specific question on daylighting, um, but it has to do with establishing a, a metric. By the way, I, I think, uh, as you can tell, I'm, I'm not uh, deeply impressed by LEED or so forth. I'm much more impressed with establishing our own measurable objectives, which LEED attempts to do, but I think we can do that and better. Um, uh, so far as daylighting is concerned, um, does the team feel that it's reasonable to establish as a measurable objective uh, the highest um, uh, daylight uh, autonomy level, not the highest, but the highest as far as, uh, say, chips is concerned, with a 300 lux you at 50 uh, for 75 percent of the uh, the uh, classroom area. Perhaps, perhaps is it Nicole who's the your, your daylight team? Perhaps Nicole, you could explain how you how you measure and know uh, that you've achieved a high standard of daylighting. What the highest standard? What the highest level that is uh, of the three levels that are stipulated in chips, for example? What it means. And my question to you is: Is it reasonable? for classrooms. I am absolutely uh, focused on classrooms. I don't really care as much about, for example, the cafetorium or the gym, offices certainly for people who are there, but the, the rooms that are populated by people, for the, by lots of people for the bulk of the day, classrooms and offices I care about and classrooms in particular. So I'd like to know whether we can reasonably expect for all classrooms to have the highest um, uh, guideline level of uh, uh, daylight autonomy um, in those classrooms. So um, explain my question if you can better than I asked it and tell me whether it's a reasonable um, design uh, objective. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, so just for some background um, and then I can go into some of the specifics of, of the question you've asked, Bruce. Um, so I think just similar to, to energy, like Bamshi was saying, getting in early and thinking about this, um, you know, at this stage is great. And um, it's really important to be coordinated with all design team members um, on the screen are just some uh, daylight considerations that we think of at this stage. Um, I'm just gonna go through them one by one and then we can go into some of the specific metrics as well. Um, but the climate and building orientation, obviously um, if, if the decision is to stay with the you know, existing building renovation, that's, um, that's uh, obviously limited um, for a new building. This would be something that would be um, the building orientation and massing would be something that'd be um, greatly considered early on. Um, thinking about, um, again, if it's a new building, floor to floor height, floor plan layout, um, we use rules of thumb really early on, um, uh, you know, so daylight, for example, penetrates two and a half times the head height of the window. So we have ideas, you know, we know, we know how climate works, we know how daylight works, um, and we can think about those things early to understand how it's working with the orientation and geometry um, of the different spaces. And specifically, like you've, you've noted, Bruce, um, we pay particular attention to classrooms. Um, that's really critical there, um, understanding, you know, the depth of the daylight into there. Um, and whatever you know, you know if, if the um, if it is the the building renovation, obviously there's more limitations there. But we really work with um, tuning it with electric lighting, making sure daylight dimming zones are properly zoned and thought about, and that the electric lighting strategies are highlighting that and balancing it, so you have an even um, you know uniform level of light across the classroom, so there's not contrast um, there for the students. Um, a lot of these, like I said, are um, a, a lot more geared towards, you know, if, if the decision is to be a new building, um, you know, glass selection, um, if there's a uh, renovation, obviously there, there may be some opportunity there for window replacement. Um, so thinking about the optimal visible light transmittance, but also linking back to energy. Um, obviously there's certain codes we have to meet with energy, but not necessarily with daylight. So I think about the solar heat gain coefficient as well um, and that sort of thing. Um, interior material reflectances, shading, um, like I said, uh, lighting controls and energy. Um, so those are the things we think about early. Um, we, we like to coordinate with all design team members um, and make sure we've got that tuned really, um, really well. Um, and um, 
you know, some of the benefits, as I'm sure all of you know, um, Daylight has, um, you know, it's a quantifiable, quantifiable tested impact on health, well-being, and productivity. Um, it's proven that, you know, having a connection to outdoors can be beneficial. It can help with circadian rhythm. And then um, it's not as big of a benefit um, just with the advent of LEDs, but um, also energy use. And we can look at that and, you know, analyze that and make sure we're counting for that in any sort of energy um, analysis. Um, so that's really what we think about. Um, so then just taking that and going back to Bruce's question. Um, so there's many daylight metrics out there. Um, you know, we I would fully agree that, um, you know, some of the daylight standards out there are not necessarily the best measure. Um, I guess generally the way that we think about it is taking all of these rules of thumb considerations um, and using the metrics that we feel works best um, for a different for a certain program um, is the best way to go about it. And that doesn't always align with um, with lead or chips. Um, lead um, and chips both, you know, they have those specific metrics. Um, and I would argue that some of those metrics could be, um, you know, could lead to a limited definition of daylight. So we really look at each of our daylight analyses that we do. Um, very specific to the program. Um, and um, for classrooms in particular, we often look at um, annual daylight, but we don't necessarily do it um, when we're designing, when we're thinking about sizing windows or VLT um, for the glass and all of that. Um, we don't necessarily feel that, um, you know, some of those uh, standards um, reflect the good daylight that's happening. Um, you know, so we, we, we try to choose the metrics specific to, um, you know, what we're looking at. So for example, we use something called daylight autonomy. Um, we usually use it for 300 lux for a classroom, um, but it's slightly different than the lead spatial daylight autonomy. Um, we also, a lot of times will go into um, further metrics such as luminance, um, which is like a visual image of a space that contains lighting um, information and can really help you understand how a space is gonna feel. And then we'll look at glare metrics as well. Um, so I know there's a lot of information, hopefully that starts to capture, um, you know, or address your question, Bruce, um, if there's anything specific you were curious about, happy to address it. Um, Nick, Nicole, if I could um, also just jump yeah. in on, on that. And, and Bruce, thank you very much for making your first statement that sometimes the devil's in the detail with lead or chips and it, it might or might not, um, you know, you might not necessarily be able to achieve it to the letter of the law, so to speak, but um, making sure that the intent is there for your community. We just went through this with another community and they just wanted to make sure, like you said, they had daylighting in the classrooms. It didn't have to be every single space per se, but, but that there were priorities and what some of the, uh, some of the items they wanted to achieve, which might not get you the extra point with lead. But with, with that said, and as Nicole kind of went through everything, and it sounds like you have um, quite a lot of experience with daylighting, is that we need to take daylighting into consideration as we look at the net zero requirements as well, and how are we going to achieve the low EUI that, that we need. And so we're all gonna have to work together and finding the uh, right balance of, of um, the amount of glazing compared to insulation, compared to um, maybe some of the other factors in order to achieve a, a low EUI for the net zero. I had one more question on daylighting, if I may. This morning, Stephen- Can I just ask one, one quick question of Donna before you do that? Um, Donna, how many more slides do you have to go through? I just want to make sure that we get through the 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 rest of the presentation um, and and keep the, the questions running. I, I see a couple other hands up too. This should be the end. Okay. Yeah, th we're we're more we're more here to have a conversation. So okay. these these were just talking points, but thank you. Go go ahead, Bruce. Sorry about that. I just wanted, didn't want to miss anything. In the visioning session, the presenter mentioned on two or three occasions uh, when we were talking about uh, daylighting, which happened occasionally, it was relevant to the uh, visioning part of it, um, uh, exemplified uh, light shelves. And, and, uh, and 
and and uh, Donna, I have uh, done quite a lot of study over the years of uh, both in buildings that I've built and also uh, daylight modeling, physical daylight modeling, measuring, and 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 pretty much established that in this climate that uh, which is substantially overcast, you know, fifty one percent of the hours of the daylight here that daylight uh, the light shelves uh, suppress light uh, they're really a strategy in my view for or at least in my view from when i was practicing uh before six years ago they're a strategy for the southwest where you have 75 percent of your hours in daylighting so i guess the question is do you guys know something that i don't that would uh, flip that on its head that suddenly uh Day, light shelves uh, are a useful and not an inhibiting a solution concept for daylighting in our climate. Or do you, uh, or, 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 or is Stephen's interest in uh, light shelves uh, not something that's shared by the team? Yeah, so, um, you know, light shelves are, I think, a, a controversial topic. I think everyone has an opinion about them. Um, there are some truths and there are some myths. So what you said is exactly right. It's more for the South or Southwest. Um, it depends on, on, you know, the amount of overcast versus clear sky. Um, for clear sky days, the benefit of light shelves is, I, I think a lot of people think that they literally bounce light um, into like onto the floor plate. Um, what they actually do is um, they bounce light onto the ceiling, which helps uh, illuminate the, you know, that surface. Um, and then they also at the same time um, cut down the, the perimeter brightness. Um, so they're actually reducing light at the perimeter. But what's that, what that's doing is creating a more even uniform space throughout you know, the a classroom, for example. And so when you're, when a student or the teacher is looking, it, it feels more visually appealing. It might feel brighter um, in terms of the actual luminance levels. Um, you know, it's uh, <laughs> up for debate um, uh, or, or up for study, I would say. Um, we, ha we haven't particularly studied um, uh, the actual light levels. It would, be, it would be a very interesting study that we've thought about for a while. Um, but hopefully that helps answer your question. Um, I think it is something we could definitely explore here, um, but we want to, you know, we could run cases with and without in some studies. And then also, like I said, um, you know, exploring in real life, real buildings. Um, we've always been curious about <laughs> actually measuring the, the illuminance. Um, and so I'm sure someone's done that study or, or perhaps that's something that we should uh, endeavor that we should undertake um, at some point. Um, and so, um, yeah, it's something if, if it were to be considered, um, we definitely would want to study it and think yeah. closely about it. So, so Bruce, yeah, back to your comment about David, David Stephen. I know two first names get to me every time. Um, he, he, I think, was just spent speaking uh, generally and holistically, but um, so, so I wouldn't say that that was a um, blanket statement that we would employ, as Nicole mentioned, but thank you. Nicole, if you give me your email address, or if I can get it, I'll send you the paper that uh, my colleagues and I wrote uh, uh, doing exactly what you said. Oh, yep. perfect. Yeah, that'd be great. Time ago, but uh, but uh, climatic conditions haven't changed that much. Yeah. So I'll get it to you somehow or other. Yeah, Bruce, that you know, it would be great if you want to run it through Kathy. She yeah, and Shane, and, and she'll make sure that it's distributed so we all have it. That would be perfect. Yeah, I'll get it to everyone. Thank you. Donna, do you think we could take the, the screen share down and, and folks could see more people if we're going to have uh, more discussion? Oh, sorry. Yeah, sure. Would, do we just, the, the only other thing was just kind of how we were going to our kind of our schedule or next steps, but yep. um, we don't need to share that now. I think we are truly excited to be here. This conversation um, is one of our first conversations because it's so important to get it right and get it right at the beginning and make sure that everyone here on this call, and I'm sure there are others that are with us as we start making decisions along the way, because there'll be many decisions. I don't want to say they'll be mutually exclusive, but there will be decisions and compromises that we're all going to have to make while we achieve um, the, the net zero for the project. So we really appreciate, and, and you're also educated in all of this. So it's great that we're not starting from zero, no pun intended. I believe we have a question from uh, Laura and I'm gonna say Drucker, but maybe I pronounced it wrong. 
Yeah, thanks, Jonathan. Um, Laura Drucker, I'm the chair of the Energy and Climate Action Committee in town. Um, I just wanted to, uh, maybe I'm still trying to understand the process and, and so maybe this feeds into the next part, but um, as Lynn said earlier, you know, we do have climate goals in town. Um, and I'm just trying to understand how we ensure an, as close to an apples and to apples comparison of different options, particularly when we're talking about an option that may involve renovation versus a, a new build, um, which means that the renovated option may not have, have the net zero bylaw applied to it. Um, I'm just trying to, to figure out how, like, what is the requirements from M MSBA around lead certification for a renovation versus a new building? Like, how do we, how do we make sure that we're getting, um, getting as close to apples to apples in terms of the sustainability of the, of the different options? Sure. I think, I think while we appreciate your bylaw somewhat excluding the renovated portion as, as part of it, but we look at every building holistically. And so our goal would be um, for a net zero energy or you know the low EUI on the building, whether it's a renovation addition or sorry, or, or new construction. And, and then if we can't achieve that, we would clearly articulate why or why a renovation addition maybe has a higher EUI than, um, than, than a new construction. But with all of our renovation additions, we bring it up to the same level as we would new construction. So, you know, we understand people have been concerned, um, for example, at Fort River, um, that there's a lot of moisture or some other issues because the site's wet, like uh, all, all of that would be addressed during a, a renovation addition. So we wouldn't compromise the renovation portion of any building. It would be at the same standards as a new, as a new building. So we will have apple to apple comparisons and what some you know, there, there may be some benefits to renovation addition, and then there are gonna be other benefits to new construction, cost might, might influence it, duration of construction is gonna influence it because we don't have swing space for the students, right? There's a lot of other considerations that are gonna go into what makes the most sense for you as a community. Does, does that help you? Yeah, maybe just okay. specifically. So the renovated option would also be fossil fuel free, for example. Correct. Correct. A hundred percent. Yes. hundred percent. Okay. Thank you. And Mr. Bill, do you, do you have your hand up again? Or was it just left up? You, you're, you're muted as well. Sorry. Um, yeah. uh, regarding my early rant, um, I think the message I was trying to get across is that my belief is based on 30 years of experience is that by the time you have done what you have to do to the envelope and to the layout and to the HVAC and to accessibility and uh, to, well, those things, you will, have, you, have, you will have bought a new building. That's my feeling. My, and I, it's not based on any detailed analysis. It's based on just my gut level feeling after 30 years in the trade. That's the message. I think that the reason you don't want to renovate those buildings is because it will cost you more uh, to do it than to just start all over. That's my message. So other other questions should we should we look now, Donna, at the at the timeline for for how we're going to assist you in making decisions? Sure. Uh, Sunny, is that something you can pull up? So um, these are the next steps we are thinking of. And as um, everyone said, we want to uh, have a really collaborate process and talk to the team and work really closely with you guys on all the decisions. And so the uh, first goal of our next step is agree on a UI target so we can get our work started. And um, usually we recommend um, 25 EUI 
as the starting point for high performance schools. And um, then we will evaluate uh, site for the potential, looking at uh, how much PV we can fit in there and the orientation of the site and extra. Then we will um, compare the massing and make, make some recommendations for the envelope. And once those are selected, we will do uh, HVAC study, compare each, uh, different options, and do a life cycle cost analysis for different options um, and daylighting analysis, um, make sure the classrooms have good daylighting while we still achieve our energy goals. And our goal is by uh, June 27th, we will have a basis of design that meets the bylaw requirements and we have um, envelope HVAC massing all selected for, for the basis of design. So we have a lot of work to do <laughs> between between now and then, and our goal would be to uh, maybe make this a regular meeting that that we have with you all, so that um, we can it, kind of a standing meeting, so that you know every three weeks or whatever. I I think we need to make sure we can get enough work done to have a, a forward thinking conversation every time, but um, it will be important that we continue this conversation all the way through. And um, PSR is the preferred schematic report, which we'll be submitting to MSBA. And that submission is what our preferred solution is to move forward. So we will be looking at uh, repair only, uh, renovation addition, and new construction. Uh, we will at one point be looking at two sites. So by June 27th, we need to pick the site and if it's a renovation um, addition or new construction. And all of that, we really need to understand our goals and as Sunny laid out here, how we're going to achieve your EUI and your net zero goals, because that will have cost implications, which we also need to submit at, at PSR. So Donna, one of my first questions for you is going to be, um, you know, knowing that you want to have some time to do some substantive work between meetings, for you and the design team, what is the what is the right pattern to our our uh, ongoing meetings? Um, well, how much time would you like? Uh, will they vary, um, so that we can, so more principally, me as the <laughs> chair of the subcommittee can begin to set up a a, a series of dates. Yeah, thank you, John. Um, Jonathan, I. Right now, uh, we are doing an enormous amount of fact finding in the month of January yep. and identifying the priorities and everything. And uh, we've already started our site exploration. So we had test pits and boring. So now we need to analyze it all and understand what that means. Um, so if, if it's okay with you, I, I we can put together a schedule yes. and send Great. it to you um, so, so that it, it aligns with the other work that we have to do, that would be great. That is about 20 minutes after three and our, our scheduled time is to end at 3.30. I still see some hands up. And so I'm gonna ask some additional questions. Oh, and I've got a, another series of, of folks that popped up. Um, I believe next is Sarah Ross and then I'm gonna to go to Russ Mernon Jones and uh, Maria Kopecki. That's kind of the order I saw them in. I apologize if, I, if I'm out of order. Thanks, just two quick things to put a pin in for future conversation. Um, one is, uh, you know, since Jonathan kind of advertised that this, this group will consider more than just Z&E, but kind of the broader sustainability considerations, um, I'm looking forward to talking about kind of what role climate resilience and what investments we should be thinking about from a climate resilience perspective in these buildings. And that could certainly go into siting and, and other elements of the building. So excited to hear your thoughts on that. And then the other piece, which you know I know is is beyond you know buildings per se, but expecting a transition to electric school buses, you know how do we think about preparing and choosing a site that will accommodate that part of our clean energy transition for Amherst? And you know Eversource may have some thoughts on that. You all will have thoughts on that. And so excited to kind of be pushing some of those peripheral, but you know important to think about now kind of topics. So thanks. Thank you, Russ. Yeah, I just want to very much appreciate the 
the level of expertise and attention to detail here and the emphasis on low EUI. And also to underline what Lynn Griesmeier and Laura Drucker said is that really aside from our bylaw, aside from the MSBA requirements, uh, we as a town are headed toward being a net zero town and not just by 2050, but getting a 50% reduction by 2030. Uh, and we want, we want that to inform the project uh, as much as the, the bylaw, uh, you know, we are, and, and to keep it in the context that we're in a global climate crisis that uh, is an emergency at this point. Um, and my hope, uh, and I was a principal of one of these buildings, one of the old buildings for many, many years, is that the process of building the building uh, can be an educational process for the town around net zero, uh, and that the building once completed uh, assists students to learn about uh, building systems and uh, net zero energy. Thank you. Thank you. Maria? Thank you. Um, I just want to um, also acknowledge uh, Jonathan and some other former members uh, that I served with on the Port River Feasibility Study, uh, and to really appreciate the fact that um, you're running a great meeting again, Jonathan, thank you. Um, and that it's lovely to have all of these voices from the community, as, as you might have figured out by now. There's a lot of folks with a lot to say, and it's, a, it's really uh, terrific to have this forum to do this. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, I see a hand up from Bruce, but I also see a hand up from Stephanie. And so I'm just going to kind of go in the order that I see them on the screen. So Bruce. Um, on the topic of the energy use intensity uh, uh, goal uh, or objective, um, it hasn't been said here, but it was on the seminar that we many of us attended uh, that uh, Eversource uh, has a set of uh, incentives that are available, uh, but I think they have a, um, a EUA of 25 or less. So obviously 25 is more than just a, an arbitrary um, uh, statement or goal if we intend to, as we should, um, benefit from whatever source might be offering. Um, so uh, that's one additional reason for, for going with 25 at least. But my second thought is that um, over the years I've noticed because I've been f checking up on the uh, energy use intensive uh, energy use uh, uh, of not just my buildings, but some of the interesting buildings that uh, done by my colleagues and particularly in Europe. And the thing that I've noticed is that um, if a building is very successful, and we all hope our buildings are successful, Success is typically means that it's more used. And if it's more use, the energy use intensity is going to go up. So we are in a situation where if we do a very good project, our EUI is going to rise. If we want to keep it at 25, um, maybe we should uh, establish a lower EUI uh, going in. And so my question to us or to the design team would be, um, well, to us, it was why not do that? Why, uh, why not uh, establish one at a little lower than 25? And to the team, um, at this point, as you are doing more of these, um, if we were to establish uh, an EUI of, I don't know, arbitrarily 22, say, um, or even 20, I noticed that many of the projects that, uh, of, uh, in the case studies that we've uh, seen that have been passed around, the EUIs are in the teens. I, I acknowledge that many of these are in different climates and that might make a big difference. So we might want to manage our expectations around this a little. But what tension exists from a, construct, from a design cost and a deliverability point of view to um, establishing a lower, but say somewhere down towards 20 uh, kilobit use per square foot per year as the EUI design goal for this building. I, I, I can take a shot at that. Um, sure. So we absolutely can look at the implications as we you know, get to 25 EUI. Um, you know, this, is, this is what this would mean to get to 20 EUI. Here might be some of um, 
the requirements to get to a lower EUI. I, I don't think uh, any of us are saying let's stop at 25 uh, for sure. Our, our goal would be to get as low as possible. Um, but we also, like you said, perfect example is if you build it, they will come. And so we need to make sure that um, we do want it to be a highly used community asset. So how can we achieve that while keeping the EUIs low. So, so we're not saying we're gonna stop at 25. We will continue to push it and then we can share with you uh, the implications of, of how, how we get it down lower than that. Thank you, Donna. And, and Bruce, I also wanna say that um, we absolutely will assist the town in the rebates and, and um, initiatives with Eversource or anyone else. And we'll start those conversations now as well, which will also help you know, the town with your initiatives. And Donna, I, if I can, whoop. sorry, sorry, Jonathan, I was just gonna add to what uh, Don was uh, talking about. I would like to take the opportunity also to tie in a couple of statements uh, the community members have made. Um, uh, specifically, Russ has pointed out um, the opportunity to, you know, the part of construction and the design of this building being as a teaching tool for the children um, and that also is a very important piece um, when it comes to actual uh, operation energy use intensity. Um, if um, what we have been seeing again and again on all these z &E schools is close to 40 to 50 percent of the EY is related to the what we, what we call as plug loads, you know, which are completely out of the control of the design team it's in the control of the occupants. So if the occupants are engaged with the building, they understand you know, not to plug unnecessary things in the uh, outlets and you know, how conscious they are in using their buildings, it will drive the EY down um, on year one of operations and onward. So it's a great opportunity to kind of tie in those two goals that community have and also the, the town has. So I'm going to try to, to slip another question in here from Stephanie, because I think she had her uh, hand up first. What I should say is if we don't get to your question, well, we will be meeting again, but certainly it also can be put in an email um, uh, to either to Kathy or to myself, um, and we'll make sure that, that the question gets out to the design team. Stephanie? Hi, Jonathan, thank you so much. Um, I don't have a question, actually. I did want to say that I shared the link to the town's climate action adaptation and resilience plan with Kathy Schoen, and I've asked her to send that to the entire committee. Um, and I really strongly ask you to take a look at that, especially the sections um, about what the town's goals are, and then also our building and renewable energy goals. Um, please take a look at that. You don't have to read the rest of it, but we think that's especially poignant and important for this um, project. And also, I do want to reiterate um, some of what's been said about that those goals about carbon neutrality and sustainability um, go beyond um, just looking at the EUI of the building. And so I would really hope that after looking at the plan that you um, consider the, the broader goals of the town that the town council uh, voted on and adopted for the town. Great, thank you. Well, I think I'm going to, to uh, move us to an adjournment for today. Um, we will be posting a, a series of additional meetings um, and obviously an agenda for each of those so that folks will know uh, what's coming up on that, that particular day's um, uh, topic. So uh, I think I need a, uh, someone from my subcommittee to, uh, to move us to adjournment. Um, I'm Jonathan, can I just ask one quick question? Oh, sure, sure. We had talked about the next meeting being the week of January 31st, which is really the first week of February. Um, do we want to talk here before we let everybody go about that date? Or Donna, this is really a question for you and your team. Yeah, she, and she, she had said that she, she was going to send me something yeah, we, via email and make okay. sure that she has sufficient time. They're gathering a lot of data okay. uh, at the moment. That's fine. So we may or may not make that particular week. So, I, so Jonathan, I'll make a motion to adjourn, and I just want to assure, I think 
I have almost everybody's email that I see on the list of who's here today. But if we if we don't have it, just send it to me or Jonathan. So as the lists get set up and we post them, you're aware of it. We were, tried to do our best to get the note notice out about the meeting today, but we would like it to be inclusive. Um, and I really thank everyone for coming. Very good. Very good. And I, I make a motion to adjourn. Yeah. All, all in favor. <laughs> And off we go. Thank you.